I'm getting a <laughs> message from the sound guy saying, speak up. It's good to see everyone here this morning. We are in uh, chapter 5 still of, of the Gospel of John, and uh, we'll be starting there. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, how holy and reverend is your name, and we come before you giving you thanks. Thanks for this beautiful day that you've given us. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be together with those of like precious faith, to worship you and sing songs of praise to your name, to remember the sacrifice of your son for our, our sins, and to learn from your word. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we, we pray that we'll take what we learn and that we'll be strengthened and encouraged by it, and that we will be motivated to share your gospel with those around us. Pray that you'd be with us in our study and that we would do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in, we're in chapter 5, and I'm going to back up just a couple of slides here. I think. Oh. Well, maybe we won't go back a couple slides. Um, if you would, go to John 5 and verse 35. Oh, there we go. Or not. Okay. John 5 and verse 35, the, or beginning in verse 33. This is talking about Jesus. Remember after he had, uh, he had, um, he had helped the, this invalid man to walk. And so he had, he had healed this man. And the thing was, is it was done on a Sabbath. And so there was some opposition to that. And so basically they were asking him, who are you and um, what, why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? That's kind of what this was. So he talks about uh, being a witness, um, about being a witness, and that he's not just a witness to himself. And thir back in 31, he said, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. This idea of deeming true, what, what was the purpose of a witness? Pardon? Verify. To verify. So this idea of a witness is to verify. So what he says is if he just verifies for himself, that's not quite enough, is it? And so he says there's another that, thank you, there's another that bears witness about me. Um, verse 32 there, he says there's another that bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. And then he goes ahead and he says that you sent, you sent to John and he bore witness to the truth. Now remember back in, uh, back under, in the earlier chapters, it talked about um, the Pharisees had sent scribes and uh, uh, others to verify who John was. They wanted to know who John was because John was doing something different. He was baptizing and things were going on. And so remember what, it, what what Jesus says about John here is he says that he bore witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Popularity of John the Baptist was pretty strong there at the, at the beginning of his, of his ministry, and so Jesus is reminding them of that, that they were happy to hear that. He says, but the testimony that I give is greater than that of John. For the works that, that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, they bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So who is he saying is his witness here? God the Father is his witness. So that's a pretty strong, that's a pretty strong witness there, isn't it? He says, and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard, 
and his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Now, is it true that, that they never had heard about, they never heard from God? They had, hadn't they? But he's about, he's going to make another, he's going to make a point here. He says, and the father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. Um, as he, he says in verse 39, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And, is, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So the way that the father was witnessing about Jesus was how? Through the scriptures, wasn't it? So, so through the scriptures, they should have known who Jesus was. And then that would have been a, a way that God was witnessing to them. He says here, he says that I do not receive glory from people. Now, this kind of goes back to Remember when, when the statement was made that Jesus didn't need to be told about men and about how men are because he knew, who, he knew men. He knew how they are. So he's, when he says that he does not receive glory from people, he says, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name, and yet you do not receive me. Remember, he kept saying that he was sent by the Father, sent by the Father. They, they weren't believing this. And he's saying that if I've come in my Father's name, you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Didn't John kind of come in his own name? He, he specifically said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the prophet. I'm not the... Uh, you know, he's saying that he, he was coming to bear witness to someone else, wasn't he? And he says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? These Pharisees, how did, how did what was their righteousness found in? It was each other, wasn't it? You know, they were saying, look at, you know, they're doing such a great job one with another. And, and Jesus is saying that you're just receiving glory from each other. You're not, you're not looking to do the will of the Father. And then he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's no one who accuses you. Moses, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So now he's, he's introducing another witness, isn't he? Who's this other witness? Moses. So he's saying that, you know, he, he said that he was witnessing himself, but he said that's not enough. He's talking about God witnessing him, and then he's witnessing through Moses because of the things that were said. He says, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So that's, that's kind of where he leaves off there in this chapter. He talks about it's important because they weren't even paying attention to the words that Moses was speaking. They, were, they were, had boiled things down to so many physical commandments and so many physical things that had to be done that they were missing the, the essence of what God was teaching. Anybody have any questions? comments on chapter 5. I want to remind us of the, of the uh, scripture that, that is the, the reason for this is the, the purpose of John writing his book. In John chapter 20 and verse 30 says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, a dis of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The reason I'm mentioning that is because we see some of these, we're seeing 
bits and pieces of things that Jesus did in his ministry. John was very selective about these things that he was included. We, see that we saw that uh, he spoke with Nicodemus. He saw that we spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. We saw now that he had, had healed this man who had been an invalid for 38 years. So now we're going to start something. We're going to go into chapter 6 here. And chapter 6 involves this story. The Jesus feeding the 5,000. Everyone remember this one? What, what happened here, just in a summary? Okay, large crowd. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the loaves and the fishes. Okay, good. Well, let's go ahead and look at some of these. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and read this. So I want to start with uh, the first verse here. It tells us that after this, so after what? Well, this was after the time that, that he was down and, and healed the man. Do you remember where that took place? We were in Jerusalem when that happened because he'd gone up to Jerusalem and it just said that he had gone up for a feast. It didn't say which feast, it just said it was a, a feast. So he was, in, he was in Jerusalem when he was talking about this witnessing and all of this. So what we see is that after this he went, he went up to uh, Galilee and this is, this is the area that he's from. This is a little bit bigger area that it mentions uh, there's uh, Cap Capernaum, and then there's this little town called Tiberias. And so what it told us here in this verse is it says, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So he's, up, he's back up in this area. Remember, uh, Jerusalem was down here, so they'd gone back up this way. Didn't say anything about the route he took. Remember when they went there, when they went up to Jerusalem, they, they went up this way through Samaria. So anyway, we're back up in Galilee. So we're up in this area here. And then it tells us, it gives us an introduction as to what's happening. A large crowd was following him. And this is what, what Lily said. There was a big crowd. And, they, and because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick, so... They were following him for what reason? Miracles, right? Signs. We talked about signs and miracles. Even John mentioned that as the purpose of writing this book. Purpose for including these signs was so that we would believe. It says, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. This is the second time John mentions a Passover. John is, is thought to have been the kind of the marker for about how long Jesus' ministry was because he includes three Passovers. This is the second one. So that means that, that he's had apostles for about how long now? At least a year. So there's, he's, his followers have been here. His disciples have been following him. He's been teaching. He's been healing people. He's been doing the will of, he's, he's been telling the people about God. He's been, and he's been confirming himself with these signs. So this is, this is about the time period there. Now, it says that he's lift, lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? So, why do you think he said that? Well, first of all, who was Philip? You remember Philip? He's mentioned back in the first chapter. Uh, back, back in the first chapter, John introduced Philip. He said the next day, this was after Jesus had been, been um, baptized, he he decided to go up to Galilee, and, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom the Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. 
Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip was one of those early disciples, wasn't he? So as we mentioned, it's been a while that Philip's been, been following along with Jesus. So when he, when he said this, you know, he said, he, he said, Philip, where are we going to buy bread to feed these people? And he said this to test him. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus is testing his disciples, his followers here. So he said it to test him, but it says that Jesus knew what he was going to do. But he wanted to hear what, what Philip was going to say, right? Because the first time he did a miracle feeding, it was to prove to his disciples who he was to himself. That makes sense. He's like, kind of like, remember, I've done this before. <laughs> you should know the answer. Right. So Philip answered and said to him, he said, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. So Philip went right to where about getting bread? The physical, to buy it. Now, now Jesus did kind of lead him on a little bit, didn't he? Didn't he say, where are we going to buy bread for these people? Because the place they were at was kind of a desolate area. It was across this cross that Sea of Galilee where there didn't appear to be much there. But so Jesus was asking him, what about this? Well, Philip's going to get some help here, isn't he? One of his disciples, Andrew, this is Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So they're, they're, they're working amongst themselves trying to figure out what what to do here because remember they've been with Jesus for a while now. They've seen Jesus do a number of things but yet they're, they're, they're still kind of struggling a little bit. So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, this is again going back to that first chapter of John where we're introduced to these new disciples. He says one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means the Christ. So another early disciple. So we see that Philip and Andrew are trying to, trying to work this out. Did you have a comment? I was just going to say kind of in their defense, there's, there's a lot of time passes, like you said, at least a year in between this, and they did eat miraculously every time they stopped somewhere in a crowd. So... In their defense, there probably were many times that they did go and, you know, get enough food at least for their group or whatever. But, you know, the gathering of the crowd and just the way, you know, Jesus testing them and stuff. It's still surprising that they didn't kind of catch on to what he was doing, but it was more like the norm probably for what they typically did is, is try to yeah. feed whoever was with them or around them or whatever. And, and it did seem to be the norm because remember with the woman at the well, where, where had the disciples gone? They'd gone to get food. So, so, um, so now we find out that, remember, Jesus said that he knew what he was going to do. So this is what Jesus tells him to do. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Now it said that was the men. That, that's a lot of people. I mean, 5,000 men and then women, children, things like that. So, so that's more than that, just 5,000 here. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten. So, wow. Ever, ever have surprise company and it's like, what are we going to feed these people? <laughs> look, look at what Jesus did here. Jesus, Jesus took two fish, five little loaves. This was, this was, I've read commentaries that say this is pretty much kind of like what a, uh, a boy's lunch would be if, if mom had packed a, a sack lunch for him. So it's not a lot of food for 5,000. But um, 
but they but we see that that Jesus took that and and showed them now it says that when the people saw the sign that he had done they said this is indeed the prophet who is to come who is to come into the world so this was a miracle that a lot of people realized it's like where's all this food coming from it looked like it was coming out of almost nowhere you know this these five little loaves and these two fishes and and he was able to feed all these people this was this is a big miracle this is a miraculous event but it says perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself so this idea that Jesus knew what was going on around him he knew what these people were thinking what were they wanting to do make him king right but they wanted him to be their king under their conditions, the way that they would have it be done. It says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Now remember, they'd gone across that lake, the, the Sea of Galilee there. It's a good-sized lake, by the way. It's not, you know, not a pond by any means. It's a good-sized lake, several miles across. And so when it was evening, the disciples got into a boat and started to head toward Capernaum. Jesus went ahead and stayed behind. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. This leads us into another story that we've, we're very familiar with, isn't it? And that's Jesus doing what? Walking on the water. Now, remember earlier in that day, what did he do? He fed over 5,000 people with a few few loaves and a couple of fish. Now he's walking on the water. And how did the how did his disciples respond to that? It says they were frightened, right? But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the at the land to which they were going. Another miracle. Right? They were in the boat. They see Jesus walking on the water. They're scared to death. I mean, seeing someone walking on the water. And then Jesus told them, hey, don't worry, it's me. And when he got in the boat, what happened? They arrived. Boom. Yes. They were about half. Yeah. So they were about halfway across, maybe, at the most there. Okay, there, there are other accounts of Jesus walking on the water. Um, we do know more details, and there's one that comes to mind here in Matthew 14. Not going to read the whole thing, but some of the highlights there is that he made the, in, in, Math, in Matthew here it says that he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So he came back down from the mountain, had the crowds disperse, told his disciples to go on. Uh, then he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. We see that he does this multiple times. Um, just think how draining it would be for Jesus to be around these crowds all the time. And so this time that he took, he spent with the Father in prayer. Um, he was there alone, and the boat was gone a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Um, talks about he came to them walking on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were terrified. That's what Matthew said. They were terrified. And, and he said they, they thought it was a ghost, a spirit, some, some, something that was uh, something else. But Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I do not be afraid. Matthew records that Peter was a little more bold than the rest, wasn't he? He, he says... Uh, Peter said to him, Lord, if it, is, if it is you, command to me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to, to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, 
O oh, you of little faith, why did you, why did you doubt? So that, that's probably more the, the story we're used to. But what we see that John stuck to is he doesn't mention anything about Peter's experience walking on the water because he's emphasizing what Jesus did and the signs that he did in the presence of his disciples. So kind of getting back into what we talked about in our introduction of the Gospel of John, John was written with the assumption that you probably know of the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This was written quite some time afterwards. So, we have it where the disciples got on a boat. Jesus joined them as he, he came out on the sea towards them. So here in the 22nd verse, it says, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went up to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. So this crowd that he fed, they, they were, many of them were still left behind on the other side of the, of the lake there, or the Sea of Galilee, and they started getting on these boats from Tiberias, so they were gonna go back and what was their purpose? They were looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? So the disciples knew how Jesus got there, but the, the crowds didn't. So any, any comments there on any of that? Lots of things happened there in that chapter, wasn't there? A lot of miracles, a lot of big things going on. Well, remember when he, when he fed this multitude, it was the loaves that they gathered up fragments of? Loaves of barley, this, this bread? Well, we're going to see, a, we're going to start seeing a, a, a lesson out of this. In the 26th verse, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, again, this is that truly, truly, he knows this firsthand. This is a fact you need to hear. He says, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Remember, Jesus knows the intents of, of people. They didn't want him for a spiritual leader. They wanted him because their bellies got full. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Isn't that a valid question? What are the works of God? Jesus answered them. He said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Remember, he was having to, to really defend himself there in Jerusalem and saying that you have witness of who I am. God told you I was coming. Moses wrote to you that I was coming. And so he says, it's the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Now look at this. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? What did we just read about? Yeah. Really, they're asking for a sign? He just fed them with, with two fish and five loaves. And, and they're asking for a sign? This is their defense. They say, well, our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus does another truly, truly here. He says, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God 
the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. <clears throat> Does this sound a little familiar? What, what's another instance that we ran across with the something physical? Remember the woman at the well? He said that he was the living water, right? And he said that if you drink from me, you will never thirst again. And so the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come down here to draw water. Let's be fair. We all live in a physical world. Isn't there things that we would like to make our lives a little bit easier? And so the, the places these people were going was pretty, was pretty basic, pretty fundamental. These are, these are things that we wanted to see. But then Jesus says to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What, what was it that he told Nicodemus in John 3.16? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this is, this is a continuation of that. The will of the Father is not that any would perish, but he sent a way for us to all be made right with him so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be brought back to him through his son Jesus. So, the Jews grumbled about him because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Now, when they sent the, the messengers to find out from John who he was, remember they were, they, they were inquisitive, weren't they? Time's elapsed since then. There's been a good year or so now. So they, they know who Jesus is now. They've done a little bit of checking up on him. And they're saying that, oh, this is Jesus. His dad was Joseph and his father and mother, we know him. Because remember, this is the area of Galilee. This is the area that Jesus is from. Jesus answered them. He said, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come Come to me, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. He says, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So, He's continuing with the emphasis on who he is. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes what? Believes that Jesus is who he says he is, right? He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, indicating himself. He says, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So the Jews started disputing among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So this is, this is where we'll leave off this morning. So if you would, let's go ahead and finish up. There's, this is a big chapter, 59 verses in this one. So we didn't, we didn't even make it quite through half. 
So if you would go ahead and read, read the remainder of that and uh, maybe even into chapter 7 for next time, we can, we can discuss that. Let's go ahead and close with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we thank you for this day, for this opportunity, for the loved ones that have come together to study your word. We pray that we will take your word and apply it to our daily lives, that we would constantly seek your guidance. For we know, Lord, that you've provided to us the words of life. You've provided to us your son, the bread from heaven. We're thankful for the many blessings you've given us and especially through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.